So joining us now, Douglas Carswell, President and CEO of the Mississippi Center for Public Policy. Good morning there, Mr. Good morning. Carswell. How, How are, you? are you? Doing great, doing great. So a lot of stuff going on uh, here in the Magnolia State. Uh, even though the legislature is not in session, therefore they ain't making any laws. That, sometimes that's a good thing. That's a very good thing. <laughs> That's what I tell them every year. You guys go easy on the making laws down there. Before. Yeah, they only want to make laws and tax us if they get together. <laughs> so, but one of the things that has kind of caught our eye here, I think uh, you and I share a, a, a common uh, aspiration in that we'd like to see the expansion of school choice here in the state of Mississippi. And one of the ways that that can be effectively accomplished is through the establishment of charter schools and there is a charter school advisory board in the state at the state level that is uh, has the responsibility of approving applications for charter schools and this this past year no new schools were approved what do you think of that it is truly shocking in order to expand the number of charter schools you have something called the authorizer board that is required to approve the applications. But it's not really the authorizer board at all. It's a non-authorizer board <laughs> because in its entire existence, it has approved a mere seven, seven charter schools yeah. in the entire state of Mississippi. Something is seriously wrong. If, like you and I and many of your listeners, you believe in school choice, it cannot be right to have a school authorizer board failing to approve. I mean, back in June, there were five very good applications put in from uh, startup charter schools, wannabe charter schools in Columbus, in Natchez, in Jackson, in Greenville. And what the authorizer board in, did in failing to approve them is not just a bureaucratic refusal. The decision means that kids in those neighborhoods will have lower life chances because of this bureaucratic failure. It's just not tolerable. I, I'm not sure what the basis of the rejections was. What do you understand about that? What did they not find acceptable? They didn't find perfection, Gerard, but per perfection when it becomes the enemy of the good perfection. is a problem. You you can't have a system where a board is looking for absolutely perfect schools because, number one, no such schools exist. But number two, when you're a startup, you're going to be what in the tech world you would call in beta form. You're going to be a startup. You're not going to be perfect. So you know, either, either we need a change of direction in the board or the board, if it feels that it, it would violate the law if it were to adopt what you might call an incubator role, mm -hmm. the board needs to incubate. It needs to bring along with it applicants who are far from perfect and give them a fighting chance to get going. I can't think of a, a single major school that started out as good as it is today. You, 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 you get better by doing. Yeah. And, and, and to, to seek perfection in the application process is a recipe for rejection. Yeah, it, uh, it, it does kind of make you wonder, will they ever approve another one? Well, this is the second year that it's yeah, not the second no. consecutive year, but it's the second year it's happened. So, now, the board will say, you know, it's the law's fault. We need to change the law. But, you know, we've been tinkering around with the charter school law for years, and we still only managed to produce seven charter schools. Perhaps we need some changes to the law. Perhaps we need to remove some of the requirements that, for example, you can only seek permission from the charter board if you're trying to set up a charter school in a failing school district. Why shouldn't you be allowed to set up a charter school in a good school district? Um, perhaps we should change the rules so that there are less restringent reporting requirements. But the whole system seems almost designed to prevent what charter schools are supposed to be, which is for mums and dads to come together and give their children a better chance and a better life chance by taking control of their kids' education rather than leaving it in the hands of the sort of people that run school districts. This is a fundamental failure of the system. And, and as you know, there is, uh, there is a group, of course, a, a large group of folks in Mississippi that want to totally eliminate all school choice whatsoever and and would not like to see that why do you think that they're so opposed to this it's it seems to be proven in other states in particular that have had school choice charter school florida comes to mind for a long time where the outcomes show dramatic improvement uh, uh, you think they oppose uh, that it, it's extraordinary isn't it how can any right-thinking person be against school choice when we see the dramatic changes it brings about for often people who who 
currently suffer from the, the worst education outcomes. I, I think, Jared, it's fundamentally because there are too many people involved in the education system. I don't mean the teachers who I think do a good job and are grossly underpaid. I mean the education bureaucrats. The education bureaucrats in Mississippi fundamentally think that the education system should be run in their interest. And school choice is a bit of a nuisance for them because it means that parents and mums and dads start to exercise choice. And that means that if you're not doing what you're supposed to do, <laughs> you'll you'll lose money, you'll lose yeah. revenue. And it's a nuisance. They want to create a a rigged monopolistic system. But it doesn't do any good for Mississippians. We already know that Mississippi is is not achieving what it could achieve because we've got school board districts that are producing consistently poor teaching grades, consistently poor management. The only way we can address this is through school choice. And yet here we have in Mississippi a bureaucratic system that is denying the extension of... School choice only really exists in theory in Mississippi. It, it, it's desperately, desperately sad for all of those kids who won't now, in those neighbourhoods, get the better life chances they could have got. I think there was a recent report that we have ascended the ladder somewhat in terms of education outcomes, and honestly, I don't know not how, you, how those are measured, what the measurements are for the I, metrics. I would take issue with that. Okay. It's often claimed by the education bureaucrats that they're doing rather well because pre-COVID there was some indication of improvement. But actually, if you look at ACT scores, which are objective and can't be presented in a manipulated way, mm -hmm. if anything, there's a suggestion that actually education standards have got worse. So I think you should look at ACT rather than taking at face value the statistics the education bureaucrats in Mississippi would like us to look at. You know, and, and I think that is a, a certainly a, a valid measurement approach. One of the things, Douglas, I've always wondered is why don't we actually measure uh, these students all the way through graduation into the workforce, what they're actually producing, contributing, how they're faring economically, even college students. It's We're so, I think, focused and accustomed to just measuring at that moment in time based on tests, ACT, standardized tests, et cetera. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but it sure would be interesting, would it not, to see how that kind of uh, correlates to, uh, say, a person who scores high on their ACT or on standardized tests, makes good grades at school. How do they fare once they're out into the job market? That's, that's a very valid point. I mean, it, it's sometimes the case that when people talk about testing and education, they forget what education is about. Education is not about farming kids through a process that produces standardized test results. It's yeah. about creating rounded adults who can go out there and live fruitful, meaningful lives. The problem, though, is that if you move away from any objective measures of testing, you really are at the mercy of the That's bureaucrats. That's true. Because the bureaucrats, the bureaucrats don't like objective <laughs> testing because it shows up their failure. Well, we talked about it on the program. You may be aware. New York City says... No, no more honor rolls. No more, no more grades. I mean, there, and I think it's in California. Have they not perhaps dispensed with SAT and SAT uh, as a uh, ACT as a uh, a mechanism for testing uh, to determine uh, eligibility for college admission? I mean, we're, we're the left is moving us away from this performance based society. That probably disturbs me as much as anything going on in this country. Well, the left often likes inflation, not just inflation in test results, but inflation in monetary terms. Why? Because if you remove an objective measure of outcomes, you you move to a world where the relativists really can take over. Yeah. We, we need objective testing. But I think when it comes to education in, in Mississippi, we, we really do need an authorizer board that actually sets about incubating new charter schools so that if they're, if they're putting in applications that are perhaps only 85% there, 90% there, they should see it as their responsibility to nurture those applicants yeah. to turn them into tomorrow's charter schools. Yeah. So it's a failure to do that that has let down Mississippi children. Uh, can you hang around? I'd love to. Yeah, we'll do another segment. I wanted to talk to you about uh, some economic matters, taxes, et cetera. We'll sort of shift our uh, attention always, to that. You always okay? to talk to Brits about tax policy. <laughs> we'll step aside for a break right here. We'll come right back with Midday. Stay with us. Welcome back, everyone. Middays with Gerard. 
In the Super Talk studios, along with Rhino, our guest is Douglas Carswell, president and CEO of the Mississippi Center for Public Policy. So, as you're aware, Douglas, the House, of course, passed a, a, a tax reform measure last year, sent it over to the Senate. Uh, didn't really get any traction, but Senator Josh Harkins, uh, he, he did inform that he would conduct hearings before the 22 session. He did that, I guess, about three weeks ago. I was among the um, the list of those who testified. I, I uh, was privileged to do that. We had. Had to come we do had. that. And, uh, but... Where do you think that's going to go at this point? Uh, there is, uh, you know, f- fairly strong feelings on both sides. As you know, this mm-hmm. is something that the speaker feels is a top priority, mm-hmm. a very top and high priority. And there are a number of other states, as I'm sure you're aware, that are also pursuing f- similar legislation. Yep. Often the debate about whether we get rid of the state income tax is a question of whether we can afford it. Yeah. I would turn around. I think it's whether we can afford not to. Now, just reflect for a moment. California has the highest personal income tax of any state in the union, and the population is now falling in California. Mm-hmm. Mississippi has one of the highest rates of personal income tax in the South, and our population is falling. States that don't have income tax in the South, like Tennessee, Texas, and Florida, or have very low state income taxes, are growing. So mm-hmm. I don't think we can afford not to get rid of the tax. The question is, is how best to do it. And there's a, a legitimate difference of opinion. On the one hand, you've got um, the Speaker, who thinks that the way to do it is quickly by a little bit of tax substitute. You put tax up on sales in order to reduce it and remove it on income. Then you've got the governor who thinks actually the way to do it is to take a little bit longer, but not to do it through a tax swap. Mm-hmm. And I, th- I I think we can have a meeting of minds between those 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 two camps. And I don't think it needs to be polarized. But But let's just remember the moral reason why we're doing this. If people are allowed to keep more of their own money, their own earnings, and spend it on the things they want, they're going to make choices as individuals, moral choices as individuals. If the government is taking that money and making those decisions for us, it diminishes us. So getting rid of income tax will not only make us wealthier, more prosperous with more jobs, it it means that we are as individuals more moral. Mm-hmm. High income tax diminishes us not just economically, but as individuals. So it's it's morally good that we get rid of this income tax. Yeah, and so you. Uh, what is the center's position on on the measure? Do you have an official one? Are you are you opposed to it as is because it does in fact raise uh, sales taxes? Well, as part of we, the measure, we've been running what we call the Axe the Tax campaign, which is to say that we should get rid of the state income tax. Mm-hmm. We recognise that to do that right away without some sort of tax swap is, is not realistic. But I'm I'm very, very nervous about putting up half a dozen different taxes to get rid of one. I I would be very nervous about raising taxes. I think what we should do is we should, even if it's incremental, we should reduce tax by saying, look, we know that the tax revenue base for the state is going to grow. Mm-hmm. It, it, it grows a little bit every year. We should dedicate and allocate that increase in the revenue to getting rid of income tax. Um, I I would be very nervous as a first preference um, about increasing tax to pay for a tax because then you run the risk of of tax hikes in one area to reduce them in another. That's not really – you might start out meaning to reduce the tax burden. You might end up with something very different. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, and and you dig through the numbers on that. It gets it gets pretty wonky, as you well know, when you start analyzing all that. And lots of folks have have done that, and and uh, I don't know that there's a consensus on on where all there, that leads. There, but. there isn't yet, but I think there could be. I mean, take a step back. The left has always been very very good at getting us to commit future growth in tax revenue yeah. to their pet projects. What we need to do is, as conservatives, turn that round and say right. As the revenue stream increases, we're going to dedicate that growth in tax revenue to eliminating the income tax. And if we can get agreement to do that, the rate at which it happens, I think we can all compromise. On. Yeah. And so one of the things that, that has kind of caught my attention is uh, what I view as a, a bit of a conflict 
in in messaging from the governor because he said that his top legislative priority I had him on the show when we were at the Neshoba County Fair last on this particular program and I asked him that directly and he said that teacher pay raise was his top priority for the 2022 session and and that uh, he's looking for three thousand dollars and that's about 150 million dollars over three years uh, but then on the other hand he said that he he really would like to see this the income tax eliminated without raising any other taxes so we've got expenses going up and revenues going down can i tell you one area where you could find money to put into the classroom sure. and the teachers pay packet straight away we wrote the fat cat report in yep. august and it was a list of the 50 highest paid public officials in the state of mississippi and it was dominated by education bureaucrats. they're hoovering up the budget paying administrators vastly inflated salaries 24 of them earn more than the governor does yeah we need to make sure that money goes into the classroom if no school district superintendent in the state of mississippi was paid more than the governor you would right away have money to employ 75 additional teachers or increase the pay packets of existing teachers we desperately need to increase teachers pay so you can attract more teachers, better teachers, make it more of an attractive career. But the way to do that is not to hike up the income tax. It's to stop the education fat cats snuffling off the money and putting it in their own pockets, which is what's happening today. Well, and, and the thing about it is, as you know, those, those decisions are made locally and they're hired by the school boards that run the school districts. It's a little cartel. It's a cozy little cartel where you've got the school superintendent and you've got the people who are supposed to be overseeing them working together yeah. and putting more of the budget into administration costs yep. than they should. If we were to cap the amount of money that we give school superintendents, we could put more money into the classroom and teachers could have higher salaries. We don't need to put up taxation to do this. We just need to make sure that the fat cat bureaucrats don't misspend <laughs> the money. How can we move the or migrate the the uh, the current pay structure for educators in this state to a more of a performance based one. It doesn't seem to be doesn't really matter how well you do it. There's a little bit of bonus that's available for that, but in general, that's not how the pay works. It's totally different than the private sector. I was looking at some recent polling that was conducted about parent attitudes across the state and one thing was really striking is how strongly people feel about the fact that good teachers should be rewarded for being good teachers absolutely and i think there's no mechanism to do that and because right. there's no mechanism for rewarding good teachers there's no mechanism for saying to people who are perhaps not very good teachers do you know what maybe maybe this this career isn't for you yeah until we get that we're never going to get the standards of education in the classroom totally you, agree Totally agree, and and that's you know just having operated a business for a long time, it just that really worked well. That structure worked but, pretty well. But maybe what we should be looking at is making a bargain with the teachers. That is, yes, we'll make sure your pay goes up. Yes, we'll make sure more of the budget that's currently going to the fat cat bureaucrats goes to you as teachers in the classroom. But in return for those higher salaries, let's have some performance indicators so that we can actually differentiate between good outcomes and less good outcomes. Yeah, it it uh, it just seems like that we're somewhat limited on uh, just on the operational model because we really don't have a mechanism to reward the high performers and sort of dissuade the low performers from continuing their <laughs> career, let's put it that way. A uh, couple of minutes left. I wanted to ask you about, uh, even though I know you focus on, on policy here in the state, Stuff ca coming out of Washington with respect to taxation on that subject. It's like George III's back scary. in charge. Scary. <laughs> it's very scary. It really is. It really is. They are spending trillions of dollars, and they need to, uh, at some point, they're going to have to put up taxes, and they're, they're looking around for a cash cow. Uh, it's, uh, we've gotten to a point where uh, the tax policy in this country is determined based on what bureaucrats would uh, um, determine as so-called fair. Mm. And rather than, well, let's look at what our needs are based on the Constitution and, and well, make so sure what, we what, fund that. One of the reasons why the American economy has been so dynamic and the most successful economy in the world is because it's had a tradition of low taxation. That's right. I agree. Certainly relative to the rest of the world. Douglas, always a pleasure to see you, Wonderful. sir. Thank Thanks you for so coming much. In. Yeah. Thanks. 
We'll take a break right here. We'll come back with more Midday. Stay with us.